Hello, everybody. <laughs> I hope y'all are ready for some beers. Or, I mean, more beers, I should say. Yeah. I, don't know. <laughs> I would imagine that it's a Saturday during a beer conference that, a beer summit, that beers have been partook, partook already. Yeah, uh, I mean, it, that's the way yeah. to do it. That's the way to do it. Definitely. Uh, so I'm Shauna Cormier, uh, and this is Mandy. I, let, I guess I'll let you introduce yourself. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> I'm the speaker coordinator for uh, this amazing summit. And uh, I'm also uh, the founder of Seattle Beer School and a Cicerone. So we're here to talk beers. Uh, Mandy, you wanna say hi? Yeah, hi, I'm Mandy Neglich. I am an advanced Cicerone. So we have two Cicerones on our sensory Cicerone little uh, panel today. Um, okay. And I'm also a food and beverage journalist and I teach blind tasting classes. So that is a little bit about what we're gonna be touching on today. And um, some of you might know me from Instagram uh, at Beers with Mandy where I do a lot of this fun tasting stuff too. Yay! And Mandy and I were just talking that uh, I just passed my written portion of Advanced Cicerone and it's all online. Woo! Woo! And it is <laughs> bizarre, you know, to take it online as opposed to being with a group of very nervous people. <laughs> but, <laughs> but super fun. And I feel like I started following you, Mandy, on Instagram before we met. So we actually have never met in the flesh before. So this is no. our first uh, soiree into tasting together. Uh, Definitely. But I, I think it's, I think like, I'm going to go ahead and minimize this screen because we don't need this anymore. And you could see, you <laughs> oh, yeah, could see, I can see. Oh, that's so much better. Uh, <laughs> and so I'm moderating. There's no other moderator. So I'm going to keep track of the chat and please use the ask a question function there. And mm -hmm. we will answer, we'll, we'll release this free form so you can ask any question you want at any time and we'll try to get to it. Um, and honestly, we don't have a, an incredible strict structure. So we're ready to go down any rabbit hole that comes up. But the most important thing is we'll be drinking beer. Yeah, definitely ask as we go. I saw someone in the chat today, they just got uh, the tasting beer book. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, anything, any questions you have as we go? Let's go ahead and our crack our first one though, if you're ready. Um, oh, born ready. Lagunitas. Um, I don't know if any of you guys got, yeah, you got the can. Okay, I've been seeing it in the cans recently, but my store only had the bottles still. I, it's so funny because I forgot that they started canning it. And yeah. I was like looking for the bottle because Lagunitas bottle is so like iconic. You know, it's like such a, mm -hmm. yeah. We have the little dog. Um, oh yeah, the yeah. cute little dog. So, so beautiful uh, this year. I'm gonna do what I like to call the Mosher pour since we're talking about Randy Mosher. Um, and it's like this very undelicate pour straight down the center. And it's yeah. going to take, that foam's going to be crazy, but it's a really great way to release all of the volatile aromas, mm -hmm. which are, oh, are so good right now. Oh my God, I haven't had yeah. this beer in so long. <laughs> yeah, no, doing that Mosher style pour that's just like straight down, you can already like, while you're pouring it, you'll start to smell that aroma coming up out of the glass. I definitely, I do, I do the tilting one usually, but I should think more about doing that Mosher style. You and know, I like to like, get mine going like by swirling more. Yeah, so. it's so funny because like, you know, we're both, we have this foundation in Cicerone. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and it goes to show everyone has like different techniques that they use or yeah. things that they gravitate towards that help them find avenues to like, for aromas to come out or like ways of, you know, uh, seeing something in a different way or all those different things. So like, we're gonna have a lot of cool uh, different avenues here for sure. No, yeah, I always compare like everyone's little routine of like pouring and sniffing and everything to like um, in the Olympics, how my Michael Phelps does that weird thing on the blocks where he like will swing his arms two times and like hit his back and then get ready. It's kind of like everyone gets into their game mode a little differently. Do you know what I mean? Like, oh, for sure. whether it's your pour, your swirl or how you're holding the glass. Um, it's kind of like turning your brain on to be like, let's get to tasting. So everyone listening, if you don't have like a little um, routine yet, it's a kind of a fun thing to think about, right? Like every time you're going to seriously get into tasting, you know, how are you holding the glass? How are you pouring the beer? What are the order you're doing things and try to do it the same way every time, at least at the beginning 
Um, Cause I really feel like it turns my, like already just swirling that, like I feel like my brain's already like, all right, let's get our nose in there and get tasting. <laughs> Yeah, like your 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 body's ready. It's like yeah. we're like we're essentially athletes, is what you're exactly. saying. <laughs> yeah, we're athletes. Me and Michael Phelps, equal, getting ready for equal races. You know, equal equal importance, tasting the oh. beer and doing the Olympics. For sure, we're definitely um, doing God's work. God's work. All right, so we're gonna get our noses in there immediately, or do we want to talk about, uh, <laughs> you know, just why? why why tasting? Like, why is it important? Yeah, I think let's go why. And we can kind of think about sniffing like from a little bit of a distance and getting back in. If anyone wants to take a sip of their beer, you should go ahead. We can't. I know we're all just like <laughs> as we talk. We're like, um, yeah. <laughs> oh, let's do it. You know what's so cool about Lagunitas for me is that it was one of those beer like brand like one of the breweries that mm-hmm. I when I first started getting into beer was like something that I always gravitated towards. Yeah, because it it was like they made those crazy West Coast IPAs, you know. And mm-hmm. I mean, this is you know a hard to categorize beer because yeah. it's like it's a wheat, but it's like sixty four IBUs, so it's bitter. Yeah, and you definitely get that bitterness after that, even that first sip. No, that's why I picked this one because I think it's nice that this one kind of walks the line between a couple styles, whereas like obviously the Chimay is like very clearly its style. Um, yeah, because yeah, this one's kind of an American wheat. It's kind of a pale ale. It's definitely, especially depending on how fresh it is, it can have like that big, like orangey flavor to it that I feel like is so pale ale. Um, oh yeah, for sure. But uh, yeah, as far as why why tasting, I mean, I guess that's why, right? It's like you kind of are trying to define something and thinking about it. It helps you really enjoy something more because you're just thinking about it more, right? Like taking those couple seconds or minutes to analyze something. I feel like helps it stick in your memory and also just like helps you create more of a memory with it than just like passively sipping a beer, doing whatever, you know? It's like giving yourself the permission to be in the moment, right? We're all Mm -hmm. like, so go, go, go. So many things happening, multitasking. We're like answering this email while we're doing this, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, let's breathe. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Let's pour a beer. Like let's how beautiful it is. And let's like, not all the things that are coming to mind, right? I mean, that's just like a personal thing. And then there's like professional reasons to do it as well. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, like if you're working in a bar or a restaurant and you need to make sure a beer is fit for service, like you, or you just tapped it and you want to make sure it's tasting okay, or you want to be able Mm -hmm. to describe it to people. So, and then there's like, if you're a home brewer, you want to see, you know, how is my homebrew doing? Like, yeah, how's it measuring it up? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um, yeah. You no. Know, one of the most fun and most humbling things when you're a home brewer is like making your own Belgian double and then trying it next to Chimay <laughs> and being like, okay, how close did I get or how far away is it? You know. Um, so, but that's definitely yeah. That exercise is what getting that final taste. You know, thinking about what you would change, how things compare, is like definitely something that you want to be able to do to improve and you know try to get try to get those medals or try to impress your friends, I guess, or whatever your home brewing goals are. Um, yeah, and then obviously like, the other reason to taste is certifications like BJCP and Cicerone and judging. Exactly. And it's, you know, it's interesting because I've had people, mostly dudes actually, be like, why, like Cicerone is so stupid. Like, why do you need that? Why do you need a, a certification about beer? Mm-hmm. And it's like, well, because it's, it, it's a foundation of knowledge that it, mm-hmm. you know is correct. There's a lot of um, information out there that sometimes, you know, isn't really based on science or like the, best techniques. And that's not mm-hmm. saying that Cicerone's the end all be all, of course, but you know, it's an, I think it's an important step in the right direction for sure. Definitely. And I mean, it's something that pushes you. The thing that's nice about this certification compared to other kind of industry certifications is it's such a wide breadth. So if you are a home brewer and you know your styles and your sensory, but you've never, you know, poured a draft beer off of like a real draft system or something that's not like corny kegs, you know, like it teaches you all of the back end of draft, like how beer should be served, how professional places are, you know, shipping and taking care of their beer and, um, you know, like things like ingredients and stuff. I don't know. I think it, it, it pushes me at least to widen my knowledge instead of like going so in depth. If it was up to me. I'd just be tasting beers and thinking about styles all day. <laughs> me too. It's so crazy because when I first, you know, I started as like just a beer lover. Right. And then uh-huh. I started, I learned how to homebrew and then, you know, it's a slippery slope of like, once you receive, you have a little bit of knowledge, you realize how much you don't know. And that's oh, totally. my, my life all the time. I'm like, oh, okay, I did this. I should know. 
all the things now. And I'm mm-hmm. like, oh my God, I need to learn so much more. <laughs> and so, you know, then I went down the Cicerone track while still homebrewing and it was like, uh, oh, it's not just about Mickey beer. It's like historical facts. And, mm-hmm. you know, we can't even get into water. I don't think we have time to do that. <laughs> no, I know. I left that off of my little tasting sheet because I was like, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm starting to see people saying their, uh, their notes in here. So if we want to oh, go yeah. ahead and kind of d- dive into, I guess, the order that we both taste and think about what we're going to get. Um, I guess the first thing that I always do is while you were pouring was like the perfect time to do it is that like distant sniff, you know, just to see when I'm holding the beer, like almost a foot away from my nose, like, can I smell anything? Because sometimes, especially like IPAs, you can kind of get like that strong, like top note, especially when it's like a more piney beer or like more dank from far away. And I think as it gets closer, you can almost get blind to those really strong top notes that you get far away. So I think it's like, you know, just, I always take a quick sniff to see if I can smell anything. I don't think I get, this one doesn't have anything super strong to me, at least this far away. Um, I don't know about you, but. I, I feel like when I first opened it, and maybe it's just because I haven't had it in a while. So yeah. I was like very perceptive. As you said, you get used to things, right? Right. Um, and we've had it open for a little while, but I definitely got a, a whiff of like some pininess. Um, yeah. It, and and, and then like a hint of citrus peel, but I couldn't identify really. I was just like, is that grapefruit? Is that orange? Is that tangerine? I'm not sure what. Yeah, I think now that I'm getting it closer here and like swirling it a little, I d- I do get that like grapefruit, but like you said, that pith, like that um, where it's yeah. more of like an oily bitter than it is like that bright, you know, juicy is so over overused now, but I wouldn't say it's quite juicy in the sphere. <laughs> and it's always one of those cool things, like because you know, as you said, that you get um, you know, a little blind to things because it's been especially mm-hmm. if it's something that's like very volatile that will happen and kind of go- dissipate. Like mm-hmm. you could do the the cover. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So yeah, I'll typically do far and then kind of go in just for like a second and do like one little sniff and then pull it away and just kind of think about what I just experienced, you know, because it's kind of like you said, you're like, is it citrus or is it orange? Is it tangerine? Is it grapefruit? And kind of I take that second to be like process what I smelled instead of like over overdoing it with the sniffing, I guess you could say. <laughs> yeah. Like you could um, like really tire yourself pretty quickly, right? By yeah. And I sometimes feel like I'm trying to think while I have my nose in there and stuff. It's like, you know, I just need to like take a second to process it. And then I'll go back for like a two or three, like a longer sniff. Yeah, for sure. It's like the bloodhound sniff, right? Like the, Mm -hmm. like the really quick (laughs) sniff. Yeah. And then the long drawn out sniff, like the dramatic sniff, I would say. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Not so long that you dry out your nasal passage because actually I've been studying a lot of sensory science and I didn't realize like, in order to smell something, it actually has to be two things. It has to be a small enough compound, obviously, that it's airborne. And then it has to be water soluble because it literally will soak into the mucus of your nose. And that's how it gets your olfactory bulb back here. So if you don't have enough mucus, like catch all the scents, you're actually not going to smell things as strongly as you could, which I think is so interesting. And now I like love my humidifier because I'm like, I got to keep my nose, got to keep my nose uh, ready to soak all of that good stuff up. Yeah. So. Dude, yeah. It's like if you were like a surgeon, it's like your hands, like your nose is crucial yeah, right. for what's going on. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. But yeah, then sure. I'll do the covered sniff, like you mentioned, just like a mm-hmm. three little second kind of go. And then I like to like line it up with my nose before I take my hand off. So as to get the most scent <laughs> you know what's crazy it's like candied mm-hmm. orange it's like candied grapefruit peel now there's like definitely like a candied yeah i was almost, i was like wondering like maybe even a little dried apricot for me but i'm kind oh. of thinking i'm getting some like caramely malt flavor that i'm wondering me too this is <laughs> yeah i i <laughs> definitely i'm just not used to it i'm definitely getting like a like the you know like an orange tootsie roll like uh-huh. that kind of yeah. candy flavor mm-hmm. which I mean, I don't know if there's crystal malt in here. I know crystal caramel malt sometimes can give that sort of impression. Right. But mine was, let's see here. Mine was canned in December of 2020. Yeah. So, so that's, it's getting, well, for something that should be like fresh and hoppy, it's kind of getting, getting up. I don't know. And you oh, know, wait, that's, an, that's another cool thing too, is like, you know, I never thought to look at dates. Right. You know? And Mine's there's... November, so there you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like for beers that are like like you said, like pale ales, um, wheats, de- more delicate style. I wouldn't yeah. say this is deli- delicate, but like hop forward beers too. Like mm-hmm. you definitely, there's a time frame of like, you know, even past 30 days, it's going to change. 
Right. Definitely. You're going to start losing those hops. And I think as it gets old, like we're looking at like almost six months on these, it's where you get that shift in the malt a little bit where it becomes mm-hmm. more of that like candied, um, like toffee caramely than it is like that fresh, like wheat forward. I don't, at least on the aroma, I don't think you get anything from the wheat. Like I don't get a lot of breadiness on this. No, um, if someone if someone said there was wheat in it, I'd be like, oh, oh, okay. Let me especially let me with the color too, like how clear it is. You know, so many people are used to that, like um using mm-hmm. flaked wheat instead of wheat malt. And this obviously is wheat malt because it's so clear you don't get all that protein hanging out. Um, for sure. Now I don't know if everyone who's joining us has a uh, little some with them. Um they were able to get their hands on it. But if you want to throw in what you're drinking in the chat, I and your fun notes on it, give us let, let us know what you're you're experiencing. Yeah, I'm oh, just going through. I yeah, see some lemon, nasal. lemon. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 no. No, that's good. Minty green apple. Oh, I like that. Yeah, that's what I was. I was wondering what. And yeah, then, if it's like as it's fresher, because that green apple can sometimes just be like that sign of like brightness. You know, that like fresh feeling. So maybe you had a super fresh one that's like really bright, tart green apple. We should just do a a, a vertical of bearing like ages as a little something like yeah no I've done that I've actually done that with um what's it called two hearted from bells just because I wanted to like understand a little bit more about like what is the age impact you hear so much about it on these like certifications and things For and sure. in service you know you're like you're wanting to serve older you're wanting to get older beer to the front of the fridge and make sure those are things that are selling first and um it is interesting to really taste that's where I kind of picked up on that malt thing that's like a little bit hard to describe it is like a little candying sweetness that yeah. shouldn't be there yeah um, it starts yeah, it starts to get a little more like instead of it being um like the a big like it, normally it could be like oh it's baked bread or it's like mm-hmm. maybe a little uh toast like maybe yeah. not it gets to like a baked sort of treat category mm-hmm. like rather, graham crackery. rather yes exactly yeah. rather than it be like a savory sort of bread aspect mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Totally. So it's like, yeah. yeah, it starts to get into that avenue. But you know what's um, cool? Oh, go on. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, if we want to go into the next, the retro nasal sniff and kind of walk through it, that's one of the ones that I put on the the worksheet just because I think it's a lot of steps and it can be a little overwhelming, like in my um, oh, blind tasting in-person this. classes. Um, I always like tell people, I'm like, we're going to, I'm going to do it. Then we'll walk through it together because it can be Sometimes there's a little like coughing and, um, you know, not breathing when you're taking your sip. So, uh, but this is called the retro nasal sniff or it's kind of a sniff. It's kind of a sip as well. But basically what you're doing is instead of hitting your um, olfactory bulb that we were just talking uh, about through this passageway, which is like your seven centimeters up your nose to that um, bulb back here, you're using the other passageway because the back of your throat is also connected to like a pathway that goes up to that bulb. So instead of sucking it in, we're going to try to force aroma up the back of our throat, hitting that passageway in a different way. And basically you pick up different um, compounds differently. So like the other side of your bulb might personally be more sensitive to something like isoamyl acetate, which is your banana flavor. Um, That's actually one that I love to do in blind tasting classes is do a hef with the retronasal because if you do it correctly, it will actually you will think your brain thinks that it's a flavor. So your mouth will actually fill with a flavor because your brain saying, Oh, you put something into your mouth and now I'm picking up these compounds. It must be from eating, even though it, it's an aroma, it's not a taste. So um, we'll walk through that together now, I guess. Do you want to do it together and we'll kind of talk about it and then we can all, I wish I could see everyone doing it. <laughs> I know it's the like, it's hard thing is like, at least we have each other. Yeah. Uh, but it can be, it can be tricky if you're, by yourself doing it yeah so the first thing you're gonna do is hold your nose um then you're gonna take it inhale because if you don't breathe you're gonna end up coughing so take it in breath um you're going to take a small sip swish it around and now you're gonna keep your lips closed for the rest of this thing swish it all over your mouth and then as you swallow blow out your nose hard so keeping your lips closed (laughs) so i'll do it again because i didn't just do it but i'll hold my nose take a breath And this, I mean, I would love to see what you guys are saying, but like, I totally am getting like so much in my mouth, more of like an orange, like a perfumey orange, like almost like a potpourri-ish orange to me, um, that I think is a little different than what I was getting in the front to me. Yeah. Um, 
it definitely helps you be more a lot more specific like yeah with what you're getting and also what I love about doing that too is you get that moment where you just get taste mm-hmm. so if you're like just one like we're just talking about basic tastes like yeah. you could taste the bitterness in it but totally. also like it's sweet too so it's like mm-hmm. this really cool balance of sweet and bitterness which is cool as well yeah no that's a great point because yeah when you have your nose closed you're basically only going to be able to taste bitter salty umami sweet what am I missing? Sour. <laughs> I'm like, there are I, know, I, I always miss one. I'm always like, and, um, what? <laughs> um, so yeah. And that's why like what, when we think of beer flavor, you're like, Oh, what does the beer taste like? But really 80 to 90% of the flavor is coming from compounds. We can only perceive as aroma. It's has nothing to do with your taste buds, even though they get all the credit. <laughs> I know, right? I mean, I guess we have a lot of examples of that in our life, but it's like, yeah. you know, we're not quite the same as dogs that have mm-hmm. like can smell like so many things. Like their whole life story, like they probably know everything about us just by smelling us. <laughs> but like we can smell like what ten thousand, like it's really an insane amount of stuff. Yeah, no, it's pretty interesting. So someone actually won the Nobel Prize for d- scent research about like our um, genes that are related to scent, and it's like twenty percent of the human genome. It's like five thousand genes actually help with that like nose like with sensing or like sensing smell and the nasal or the uh, like smell passageway in your brain so basically like so much of what makes us human is like dedicated to smell which i just think is so interesting like obviously we're missing out on things if we're not uh focusing and using our nose because like so much of us is dedicated to smell and it's an underused sense if you ask me (laughs) oh for sure and it's like you know um how much memory is linked to aroma. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I was listening to Jen and Loy yesterday in the BJCP session, which was amazing if anyone else went to that. And, you know, it's like this, we have this common language with beer vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Once you practice and get to know it, which takes time. Um, But the coolest thing is that when we, you know, we we immediately went into like very specific things, but Mm -hmm. there's always imagery or like memories that pop into your brain first. And then we mm-hmm. can, we use it quick at bypassing it, right? So like mm-hmm. the first moment I smelled this, I was like thrown back to Fourth Avenue pub in Brooklyn. Uh, yeah. I was just like in their backyard drinking this beer and it was like a split second. And then I was like, okay, grapefruit, uh, crackers, uh, toast, blah, 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 blah. But it's like, it's, you have to, if you don't allow yourself to access those memories and those images and moments, you, you'll never get to like the specificity of shared vocabulary. No, I think that's like so important with um, blind tasting as well. Actually, you can kind of like, this is really nerdy, but here we are to get nerdy. Um, But like, you can kind of like force these like memories almost because like sometimes when I try a new beer that I've never had before, especially if it's a style that I'm not great at identifying when I'm blind tasting, like Baltic Porter is always really hard for me. Um, and I basically like got a new Baltic Porter from Jack's Abbey that I'd never tasted. And I like sat in the corner of my apartment. This is so nerdy. <laughs> but I like, put so like, green stuff all around me. And I was like, okay, now when I smell Baltic Porter, I'm going to see the color green. Cause like, I'm like forcing this new memory with this thing. Um, so I don't know if it always totally works like that, but that's what I was trying to do. But like, um, Abbey Ales, like I always get taken to Belgium. Like I've been to a few Abbeys and like drank beer on you know, at West Veteran. And I like, when I smell certain beers, it's like immediately I can like see the backyard. Like you were saying, like I see the table we were sitting at and I'm like, okay, no, this is, I can call this a Belgian beer of some kind. That's such um, a good call of, you, of it being a blind too. Like if you're doing yeah. blind taste, what happens a lot with certifications, right? It happens with uh, BJCP if you're taking the written exam um, and with uh, cis- certified Cicerone and with advanced and of course master. Um, you're going to be doing a lot of blind tasting and <laughs> what's so cool about it, I know, Mandy, you've done so many cool blind tasting classes, <laughs> um, is that we all come in with bias about stuff, right? right. Like, you know, uh, let's say a half of Eisen for me wasn't my favorite style. And I would always go in being like, you know, blah, blah, blah. But if I don't know what it is, then you, all those things are gone. <laughs> and all you could do is, all you could do is smell, look at it, feel it. And then you're like, yep. okay, here we go. Right. No, totally. And I think, I think having those biases and like knowing, cause I'm the same, I don't really like stouts. And I think that's why it's hard for me to parse like stout, porter, uh, Baltic porter, all those kind of things. Um, but once you know that about yourself, it can also help you practice and appreciate, even if you don't, wouldn't choose it, I can still appreciate the differences and the way that brewers are making them to, 
you know, appreciate their artistry that they are able to coax out these different flavors of these dark malts that maybe aren't my favorite, but um, are definitely, they ha just have so many flavors in there that I used to always just be like, oh, roast and <laughs> be done with, yeah, you know? <laughs> exactly. You're like, oh yeah, one note, banana, cool. And <laughs> you know, it would be really fun to do uh, is, you know, get some buddies together. Um, you can even do this virtually and mm -hmm. get another person, maybe a significant other or someone to pour like a, a series of beers for you maybe like uh -huh. all belgians all american whatever and then just sit there and like try to pick them apart um yeah i you learn so much about yourself right and you learn mm -hmm. different vocabulary because I, I know for one like everyone was saying pines you're like oh yeah pine but yeah. like what if what if that wasn't there and like the power no. of persuasion is deep Totally. I love, so I teach a lot of wine tasting classes that are just totally like people on date night, you know, like totally like not beer professionals, which is so fun because sometimes like we had this Weizenbach and I tasted it and I was like, oh no, this is turned, like this is a little too old. And this guy was like soy sauce and everyone's like, oh yeah, soy sauce. And I feel like so many people in beer would be a little hesitant to like call out something that, that like so umami forward, but he was totally right. It was soy sauce. It was totally like, um, What's it called? I can't think of the word. When the uh, the yeast is exploding at the bottom. Oh, autolysis. Uh, autolysis, yeah. <laughs> um, to he was like yeah, spot on, but I feel like, like you said, like sometimes when you do blind tasting, even with like your friends, sometimes it's like people don't want to say something that's like a crazy descriptor because it seems like a little too out there. And you got to just be like green onion because sometimes it's green oh. onion. <laughs> yeah, I'm so glad you said that because I was so intimidated for so long, not just with beer, with wine. Mm -hmm. any like just saying any descriptors because i was just like what if i'm wrong or like what if what if that's people are gonna laugh at me and it's like yeah. you know what like your truth is your truth if you're smelling that then you're smelling that mm -hmm. if you're experiencing that's what's happening now i know sometimes we can also invent things right because right. we're like we think it should be like this mm -hmm. i know that an american west coast should have this this and this so i'm going to say that but it's right. like if you don't know what it is then you're just going to say oh it has moderate aggressive hops bitterness it's going it yeah. has this and then you have to describe it you know as specific as possible yeah so, i'm gonna go ahead and pop this one yeah if you're ready because i'm looking at our time i want to be able to compare them a little bit i i don't know about you guys but i could only find the big one which i'm pretty excited about because i love popping a cork <laughs> you could only Woo! find the big one. Oh. <laughs> um I miss, I, I miss, there was used to be so many more 750s out there that uh, had the corks. Look at that. It's kind of fun to look at them next to each other because you don't really think of Chimay necessarily as like a hazy beer, but now comparing it to how clear the Slaganese is, you're like, oh, or yeah, at least for me, it's not, it's not brilliantly clear for sure. Yeah, um, I definitely poured mine kind of aggressively, so I'm getting some mm -hmm. sediment, but it's not crystal clear. I know, no. you know sometimes it can be. It's so pretty yeah. though, those like red highlights in it. Yeah, definitely. But speaking of, you you reminded me of wanting to open this because um, I think with blind tasting and definitely with judging too, like you said, you can create things. And so this beer to me has like a ton of banana on it, um, especially when it's like fresher, more than other Abbey Ales at least. Um, and I have tasted it in blind tastings and been like, then all of a sudden I create in my head that it's a Weizenbach. And I'm like, oh, I'm also getting this. I'm also getting, just cause you get that banana, you know how you can be like, oh, and I, oh, there's clove there. There's no clove there on this. <laughs> like there's definitely not, but I can totally create it in my head. So I tell people when you're blind tasting, like for a test, not just for fun, if you really want to get into it, I think it's really nice to go down a list of things and be like, okay, what's not there. So I'll start with like, um, is there American hops, like grapefruit? Is there this? And kind of go by, even though it's obvious there's not American hops here, I think if you go down the list in your head and say, is there clove? No. And then you're like, okay, so what is there? Is, you you stop yourself from creating these things, right? Where I just sniff this, I'm like, is there clove? Nope. Is there American hops? Nope. Is there English hops? Nope. You know what I mean? And then then you're not building up from the bottom where you're like, oh, I got banana. Oh, I got clove. You're kind of work winnowing it down, if that makes sense. Um, I feel like that was Which a breakthrough is, for me on blind that's tasting. A, that's a huge, it's a great technique. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like being able to start from somewhere because, you know, if you're blind tasting, especially for a certification, you mm -hmm. could get, your nerves can get the best of you and you could start to just like get flustered. But if you have a, a starting point, like you are able to just start power deduction you know yep. it's not this you know it's not that you know it's not this 
Mm -hmm. then you can start to narrow it down pretty quickly. Right. Um, and another cool thing is just starting with, okay, I'm just going to start with what I smell yeast wise. Like what kind of mm -hmm. yeast characteristics are there? What esters am I smelling? Like this fruitiness, what phenolics, what sort of like spicy, more spicy character am I getting? Mm -hmm. uh, what are the malt, what's the malt character? What are the hops? Yeah. And then, then you could start to like, you know, sort of morph this into something yeah. that's tangible. Definitely. So I, let's, if everyone wants to practice their retronasal again, I hope this yeah. is something that we can all take from this. You, everyone in bars will be plugging their nose and uh, <laughs> doing that when we can all go back to bars again. But uh, so we're going to hold our nose, take in a breath, take a sip. Keeping your lips closed. And that one, again, I don't know, the banana for me, it just like totally comes out of this one. Um, compared to so many other Abiels that I feel like are more of those like berry forward and like red fruit more strongly. This I feel like has that like banana plus definitely some of that like Abby, you know, red fruits and uh, sweetness going on. It's so funny because the banana for me is not the focus. You yeah. know, like, and I know because you told, I knew about the banana, you know, I yeah. know about the banana thing. But for me, it's like more red fruit. And I yeah. definitely, um, like especially with doing the retronasal one, mm -hmm. um, it's more like juicy fruit rather than banana, like juicy fruit gum. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally, yeah, that, that's like kind of similar though in a way when you think about it, like juicy fruit kind of like that, like a circus peanut thing too, where it's like um, more of a flat sweetness than it is like a citrus sweetness, I guess I could, or like a, like a starch fruitiness than it is like a citrus fruitiness, I guess to me. For sure, um, yeah, 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 that makes sense. But um, no, definitely, I think, I mean, and Abby's character is just like, so wonderful. But someone asked, I think, what style this is. This is a, a Belgian double. So there's like in Belgian, I guess you, there's single, double, triple, dark, strong, golden, strong are kind of the range of Belgian Abbey Ales that have this kind of yeast character. Um, on my little sheet, I think I, I hope I put Belgian yeast character. Um, yeah, I, I tried I'll to like quickly go through just like I'll the different yeast. Um, Here we go. But. Yeah, and uh, there's a lot of people saying in the chat here what we have, uh, like caramel apples, white pepper, mm -hmm. earthiness. Yeah, totally. I love that. Yeah, the caramel yeah. apple for sure. Uh, Definitely. Prune. Yeah, and there is oh, like yeah. a little pepper, totally. I get total like prune as well. Mm -hmm. And there's almost like a current sort of like, and it's crazy because this beer, if we do like the, the same, we want to do the retro nasal again and then think about taste. Mm -hmm. Like this, this beer has the impression of being so sweet because it's fruity, mm -hmm. but it's, it finishes very dry and there's like a nice bitterness too at the end. Definitely. I mean, it's not sticking around on your palate at all. And I think um, that Here Belgian like color. special bee kind of malt, you know, that can have that like prune, like really dark raisin kind of flavor, I think is something like coming through in this too. You get that like candied Belgian malt for sure. Um, and this is something, you know, that I... I struggled with and it's it's because it's something that seems very nerdy and almost like overboard is when you're describing something like giving it like the the a, a, like is it low medium mm -hmm. high aggressive right. you know those kind of like notes to be very specific about it like saying like it's really hoppy is mm -hmm. is vague so right. like being, this goes for like bjcb too is being as specific as possible and it's hard to train your body to do that Mm -hmm. because we're not talking that way normally you know right. what I mean like we're not at the bars we're like oh I'm getting uh moderately high levels of prune with mm -hmm. you know and when I the the taste is m moderately sweet with low bitterness mm -hmm. but you know that's like in a certification program or if you're uh you know judging a beer to give feedback to someone those are important things to to keep in mind because it's it actually is helpful. It's like a, right. it's not subject. It's, it's objective, not subjective. Definitely. No, it's, yeah, it's more like quantitative, more like putting things on a scale, um, which is helpful exactly. for people when they're trying to switch what they're, or, you know, develop their recipes or improve their brewing to style. Um, or when you're writing for like a, a tap list at a restaurant, like you want to give people, set people's expectations. And I think like a lot of the, um, the descriptions we're seeing here, like caramel apple is so good because it's like everyone's had a candied apple or a caramel apple, you know, and it's like a little more descriptive than just being like, oh, fruity. Like it's a little more interesting. And so I think that's definitely something that's a challenge for me because I so easily fall back on those things that are like typical descriptors of esters, you know, when you're saying like pear, palm fruit, bubble gum, like that kind of thing. Um, 
So I love seeing like, like you said, tasting with other people is so great because you learn these like new descriptors or things that you didn't think of and like you can kind of create together. Yeah, and it makes you feel like you're not being crazy. You're like, mm-hmm. oh, like, you know, reading Stacy's comment, just flipping realized I'm connecting caramel apples with farmhouse flavors. 4-H kid here and I've always had caramel apples at the fair. Oh, so it's like so specific go. to her and then it's like, oh, but yeah. it also is connected to something that's real. Mm-hmm. And then like fruitcake, banana to fruitcake. This is totally fruitcake. Yeah, here. yeah, like, totally. Oh, there's like a nutty quality to it mm-hmm. and it's so crazy because this beer is like the grain bill is very simple yeah <laughs> and it gives this impression not all doubles like this but mm-hmm. you know i believe chimay is just using like pilsner and can dark candy sugar yeah i think it's the dark candy sugar yeah exactly so it's um, and that's what gives it the dryness too which is so nice god um, bless the belgian list. we have a few questions i'm just going to get to those real quick yeah definitely Oh my gosh, time um, is going so fast. <laughs> I know. God, I was like an an hour. My goodness, how are we ever going to fill the time? <laughs> okay, so, uh, okay, let's stop this one. What is your opinion on how best to reset your nose palate when tasting testing? I love it. Yeah, um, I don't know if you want to, I think the one that kind of everyone says and works for everyone is just smelling your own body scent. So I actually, this is, I'm letting all my dork secrets out, but like to every sister on test, I wear the same scarf <laughs> and it's like just really easy to grab your scarf and smell it instead of like a lot of people smell like their elbow or like kind of like their shoulder area, but that's just like getting your own scent back in. And I also, I always drink sparkling water between, um, instead of normal water. I think it scrubs it a little bit. You just want to make sure there's not too much salt in your sparkling water. Um, yeah, that's there's a good call. in there, but that one's pretty, it's a mineral one too. So it's nice because mm-hmm. it kind of has like a good structure and yeah. carbonation to kind of scrub. Yeah, right. I do the same thing. I like, I smell my shirt. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, you'll find your own. I kind of, or you can even just like step away for a second, but like smelling yourself is great reset. A lot of people like uh, using coffee beans, but that doesn't work for me. Doesn't um, just because it's, it's too intense. Mm-hmm. Um, I know oftentimes they'll give it to you when you're doing like hop flexion and stuff like that. Because it's almost impossible to even smell your shirt at that point, right? Because you're just so covered in it. Um, yeah. But yeah, smelling yourself is one of the better techniques. And if anyone else has a cool technique that they have, please throw it in the chat. Yeah, I see a lot of people who do their hands and smell their own hands, but I would suggest away from that a little bit, just because like hand soaps now, and especially we're all like sanitizing our hands all the time, can be so strong. Um, yeah, like I've definitely sanitized my hands at a restaurant and then like, I can't drink my beer cause it's like the sanitizer on your glass is like so close to your nose. And it's like the other day I had like this mint flavored sanitizer on our table. Oh. And I was like, this is, how can I, how can I enjoy anything when every time I get my hand close to my n- nose, it smells like mint. It's like, it's crazy. <laughs> That's like why if you're going to super nerd it out at like a BJCP sanctioned, uh, you know, uh, judging event, like the soap in the bathroom will be replaced with a unscented soap. Cause it does affect yeah. your, the whole situation. I have a, there's a question in the chat. Oh. So if you want low salt, does that mean crackers or pe- pretzels are a bad palate cleanser? It's a good question. I, I think like water, cra- I mean, water crackers are pretty neutral and I know saltines mm. are often, uh, unsalted saltines are often used and those work for me, but they are, they do have a flavor. I mean, there is yeah. like, they definitely um, taste like Pilsner ball in a way. Like there's like, you know, so. No, I was going to say, I think is- they're a little dangerous because if you're like, yeah, taking your test, right. And you're like. Yeah, it's, I think they can give you a little of that like false malt perception. Um, like I, I had at Cicerone, they give you the uh, cracker, the unsalted saltines. And like mm-hmm. I, I felt I had a goza on my flight and I felt like I stopped eating them because I was like, I think this is giving it more malt flavor than it actually has in my head. And yeah, I don't know. So, but like and everything's going to be different for everyone too. Like Exactly. I was just going to say that. I was like, we're all sensitive to different things. So you'll learn the mm-hmm. more and more you do it. Like, we give you our permission to drink beer every day and like mm-hmm. find your own techniques that work for you. Um, but yeah, I, let me, I have to see what other questions we have here. Awesome. Okay. So uh, do you feel like beer tastes differently when it's poured from a can as opposed to a bottle? I love this question. Cause I do, <laughs> there's no science really to prove it. And brewers especially will tell you all day. There isn't a difference, but I especially feel like with these like Belgian beers, I don't know about you. I mean, so St. Bernard's had started canning their wit. I think it's totally different than it used to be. I just, as far as the sharpness of the carbonation, um, which is this a little tangent, but like 
scientists are starting to think that carbonation is a flavor as well as a sensation. So that's not totally agreed on in the scientific community. But um, I do just think it takes on a different quality. Even when I'm like blind and I don't know that things have been poured from a can, I sometimes do think that um, the carbonation is a little less intense. And that's basically the difference, I would say, is the carbonation. But I do. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, like because so many people started canning in the last year or so because you're essentially forced to. Um, mm-hmm. If you wanted to keep keep in business, um, there is, are so many techniques to canning that are so different from bottling. Um, mm-hmm. So you know, like dissolved oxygen can be something that can come into play that can affect oxidation. Yeah. Um, carbonation levels. There's like there, there are two two different very different vessels. I mean, the mm-hmm. cool thing is with can is it does protect the beer better than a bottle when it comes and to- it's better for the environment it's like lighter to ship more recyclable easier to recycle all different kinds of things um so i but i think like if i was having an ipa out of a like little sum i would not i don't think i would notice a difference between a can and a bottle i don't know why i just think those like higher styles that are like supposed to be a little bit higher carbonated um i feel like i've noticed that but that can also like you said we've been talking about bias and tasting all day so it could just be there's um, you know there's there's also not a lot of canned conditioned beers. So it's like. Um, well, it's almost impossible to do, I think, because they have to be under, right? The, the pressure is different. The pressure is different. So it's like we're yeah. talking about bottle conditioning. So like, you know, if uh, a lot of the beers that have bottle could have to withstand a certain amount of um, pressure. Um, mm. But that that could change it as well. But I think there's pros and cons. But I this is something that I guess we should look into the science for. <laughs> Yeah, no, definitely. Because I mean, it's easy to tell on draft beer, right? Like the carbonation is always going to be on different on draft. Um, things typically can take on a little bit more of a freshness flavor on draft compared to bottle, but then bottle versus can, I think, juries out on exactly if there are any differences at all. You know, it's funny that the, when you just brought up uh, carbonation being like uh-huh. a, a taste, mm-hmm. and I realized we didn't really touch on mouthfeel at all. Um, yeah. I think maybe we did sort of, but like yeah. how how important that is, right? Like it was talked about in wine a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and I like the term texture because I think mouthfeel is a little, a little sketchy sounding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, how it literally feels like it, body and carbonation and, um, you know, slickness. So you can get some off flavors that come into mouthfeel. So it's like another specificity, another thing to be specific about when you're drinking your beer. Because it can, sometimes you don't know what's off about a beer. And you're like, oh, it's just the mouthfeel or something that, it's like too, it's like, doesn't come across as too sweet, but it's thick. There's something, or it's like you know, slimy so, sometimes. Yeah. Um, oh. Yeah. Actually really quick, <laughs> just as, as far as we did all of our different sniffs, right. But I do do three different tastes when I'm blind tasting every time. Um, my first sip, I just try to get the flavor of the beer and compare it to what I was getting in the aroma. So like on this, you know, we were kind of smelling, we did our retronasal and then I like to do one snip just to say like, is there anything that's unexpected in the flavor? maybe that I wasn't getting in the aroma or is it more bitter than I was expecting or sourness you can't always get um, in aroma. You can sometimes certain kinds of sourness you're really only going to get in the flavor. Um, the second one I do is the mouthfeel. So I just kind of try to feel how how prickly, how fast does the carbonation go away on my tongue? How full does it feel on my palate? And the last one I do, I take a sip and then I breathe out and that I try to assess like aftertaste and then uh, the alcohol warming as well. So like just like that because I feel like it can kind of show where the warming is hitting in your throat and the further down you feel that burn of alcohol warming the more alcohol is in the beer um yeah so yeah. just a quick if we were going through like the whole process that would be all the different sniffs and then those three tastes I do every time oh I love that I love because you're like focusing on something different every time so it's mm-hmm. not like you're trying to do everything all at once yeah, you know, I've had yeah, to like you, figure out ways not to overwhelm myself because I feel like if you put too much pressure on the first sip, you're like, you know what I mean? You can get like a little overwhelmed. And so I'm like this, I'm only going to think about this. This, I'm only going to think about this. I love that. Yeah, I do. Like I try, I don't try to get my nose in there as soon as possible because like looking at it, you can't help but look at it first. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, you know, then I just focus on aroma and then you, then I focus on taste, just like mm-hmm. what, what are the main tastes? Like how bitter yeah. is it? How sweet is it? How sour? Blah blah blah. Umami, salt, and yeah. and then mouthfeel. And then mm-hmm. like I'm like then I sit back and go okay, go back in and be like what's like do I like it? Like what's the overall experience? That's when I can start yeah. to be subject. That's when I can be like 
oh, I love this or mm, something, something about it. You know, yeah. like there's, and that's like following BJCP guidelines as well. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, finding your own sort of way of doing it is, is great. Yeah, definitely. Okay, we have a couple more questions here. Okay, I'm initially pursuing the certification to help others enjoy beer socially. Can you tell me of career opportunities that are common and not as common once I become a Cicerone? Great question. Um, yeah, I would say like my path with Cicerone is a little less common I, or it's not as in the beer industry, I guess, like I, as a journalist and I write the home brewing column for Vine Pair. Um, it's a little less common, but I went to school for journalism. And so that I kind of took this, the uh, certification and used it in the way that it made sense for me. But I think that's what's great about this certification. It is self-taught, right? Like you're not going to school. Um, so you're, you're, you're doing self-study um, and then you can choose what to do with it afterwards. But the downside of it being self-study is you didn't go to school. So then you don't have like this network or like, you know, your guidance counselor at your college or something who can like help you, not guidance, career counselor, whatever they were called, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that can like help you go get a job. So it's it's really, um, I guess, on, on you a lot. I will say like a lot of breweries when they're looking for people in sales or to work in their tap rooms or to like be tour guides, they do like to put like at least beer server as like a requirement on job postings. Um, I know a lot of people who are beer servers and certified Cicerones who work at breweries in all different areas, including like marketing and development and that kind of stuff. I don't know if you have thoughts on the different. Yeah, problems. you know it's interesting because at first I was like, I don't, I don't need to do this. The more I got into it, I was like, learned more about Cicero, and I realized that it was helpful for my own personal journey to like focus on learning every aspect about beer. So not only how to brew it, how to taste it, but like different, you know, regional history. Um, like very specific parts of water, malt, hops, like getting really deep into things. Um, and, you know, the more and more I got into it and like started to choose that as a career rather than just a social thing. Um, it, you know, some places are really into the fact that you're a certified beer server or mm -hmm. a Cicerone, any level of Cicerone. And then some places don't care about it. But honestly, and I always try to avoid this and Mandy and I were just talking about this, like, mm -hmm especially as a woman, sometimes you over certify yourself because you, you want to, you, you shouldn't have to prove anything, but you're like, there's so many other, you know, the, the, the predominant people in the industry don't need those. Cause they're just, they're mm -hmm. already there. They already had the leg up, but it, I think it, for me personally, it helped at least prove that I was like, Oh, at least I got this. Yeah. But no, it, 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 it's a confidence booster for sure. I feel like it's something that, you know, it proves that, you know, not, you have knowledge in all these different areas. Um, but to your point too, we, sh we shouldn't need that confidence boost because we're already awesome and should be able to get all these jobs. That are exactly. out there, but so. It's just one of those things you're like, Oh, have to overprove and you have to spend so much more time and energy, like getting this certification and getting this degree and doing this when it's like, you know, you don't, it, we, I wish that wasn't so. Yeah. But I'm also so happy I did it. I think it's a great program, but. Um, but and if you're talking say, like, yeah, we can't fully answer this right now, I feel like, but if you have questions about like your career path or, or want suggestions about things, I mean, definitely find us on Instagram or wherever, Twitter or whatever. Yeah, um, Twitter. <laughs> yeah because I love like connecting people with one of my, my friends. I was able to connect with a brewery here in New York and now she's like their event planner and stuff. So I don't know. We we're definitely here. It's, it's, it's an intimidating industry to get into. I feel like, um, but everyone's actually so friendly. And like, as soon as you feel comfortable reaching out, I feel like opportunities just open up for you. Um, I was so nervous because I was like, oh, I've never professionally brewed. I don't know. I was nervous to like get into things and, you know, do beer stuff. And I shouldn't have been. People are really nice. Yeah. And it, it's true. It's like we people are, especially in this group that I've seen that have been coming to the summit, could not have been more helpful giving a hand up. Be like, what mm -hmm. barriers in the way? Let me push it out of the way for you. Mm -hmm. And so especially reaching out to uh, women and underrepresented people in the industry, you know, we have each other's backs. That's what I feel. Like, at least I have your back. I'm going to say that. Like, <laughs> I, I will have all of your backs. So if you ever need anything, do not hesitate to reach out. Okay, it looks like we have about, like, 10 more minutes. So I'm just going to see what other questions we have. I hope that answers yeah. your question. <laughs> uh, tips for when doing blind tastings. Clues to to kind of determine styles? 
Um, so tips for blind tasting, I would say the, I tried to put on that sheet a little bit. Like, so basically what you want to do is get like the, like a great example of your style, like a Belgian double, perfect quality example from the BJC guy, BJCP guidelines, then kind of think, okay, what flavors am I getting from yeast here? What flavors am I getting from hops here? What flavors am I getting from malt here? And then like what other flavors that could be like barrel aging, it could be additives, um, like some styles, you'll always get coriander or orange peel in. Um, and then when you're you're blind, so try to kind of get what you think about each style if you can in those different categories. And then, like I said, when you're going through blind tasting, instead of saying, okay, what am I tasting here? I think you can say to yourself, what am I not tasting here? So you can say, are there American hops here? Yes or no. Are there, but you have to go through all of them, right? So you have to say like, are there German hops? Are there this? Even if you think there's American hops, I think it's really important to go through all the categories of those things. And then at the end, you'll say, okay, I only said there was yes to American hops, bready malt, um, no yeast character. And so you'll say, oh, this is either a pale ale or an IPA. And then you can kind of get into the specifics and say, okay, how strong is it feeling? How much alcohol warming am I getting? It's kind of about knowing the style guidelines and then knowing the way that you perce perceive those styles. So like just taking an afternoon and really sitting with one beer and writing down everything you're getting. Um, I think that's a good place to start. That's what I used to do. I, would, I downloaded the app on my phone, the BJCP apps, and that's mm -hmm. what Cicerone uses as the, and, you know, the Brewers Association has guidelines as well, and they're very similar, um, yeah. but they have an app, you download it, and every time you sit down, even if you're, you know, out somewhere, once, I guess now we can start to go places, um, just for the first two minutes or three minutes, whatever, just sit, pop that app open, whatever style you have, and Man, you're right. Pick one that's like a commercial example. That's like, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to hit all the marks and just read through those, have a piece of paper to write down your own notes so you can personalize it. Mm -hmm. And then just, you know, keep a, you know, if you want to be really serious, like every week, pick a style and then just try different styles of it. Yeah. Um, or like a, a cluster of styles, like um, I'm going to do Belgian Abbey and Trappist styles, and I'm going to drink through all those. And then yep. you can start to build on that and go, oh, I'm going to do styles that are very similar to each other and start to break those apart. And that will help you with blind tasting because then you have a memory bank of mm -hmm. all those beers, but it just yeah. takes some practice. Yeah, and trying and, I mean, once you start trying things blind, it really does throw you for a loop. So I would say, don't lose your confidence. Like I still do blind flights and get things wrong. So um, definitely. Oh my God. Just, yeah, it's, it's very humbling sometimes. <laughs> we talked about that. I was like, had, did a blind tasting with my, my friend and like my husband poured us these beers and I was like, I thought I was having like a mental breakdown over it. I was just like, yeah. what is this? I like couldn't <laughs> handle it. And you have to be humble and be like, dude, you don't have to know everything. And sometimes the beer just, you just don't, can't figure it out. And that's yeah. okay. Exactly. Uh, there's a, there's a really cool comment in here about, um, talk about Allison Schramm noted. She, uh, she'd got all the certifications to prove that she deserved a seat at the table alongside her business partner, her father. Mm -hmm. And she put, I pointed out that if she'd been a son, that wouldn't have been necessary. Wow. Yeah. It yep. sucks to prove things, you know what Definitely. I mean? But, and it's just um, important that, yeah, we can be here for each other as much as we can and just keep you're not alone. together. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's see what other questions we have because we're running out of time. Okay. So I've had a lot of homebrew, not mine, that tastes very watery or thin. How do you describe that in tasting situations? I think you described it perfectly. <laughs> That's like a combination of the mouthfeel and waterly. So you, you can kind of say like maybe a lack of malt flavor or I think, I mean, I think watery and thin is totally a descriptor and some, someone needs to look at either getting more malt backbone in there or something's not carrying through all the way, maybe yeast character. Um, but yeah, I yeah. think that's, that's exactly what I would say. <laughs> that's exactly what I would say too. And then like, you always want to provide, like if you're doing a, especially a judging situation where you want to provide feedback, you mm -hmm. say you want to include some more uh, fermentables in your, your grist or, you know, mm -hmm. exactly. Like maybe, maybe there's just a little too much, uh, bird. I, you know, there's oh, so many things you could say that, yeah. that help. but yeah, those mm -hmm. are perfect descriptors and like varying degrees of watery. Like, is it super watery or is it, like, you know, like a, a little on the watery side. Right. Okay. Any tips to prepare for Cicerone certification prior to signing up for a course? This is new to me and very interested in the certification. In love with homebrewing, just started on New Year's Eve. Cool. Oh, fun. Um, I think homebrewing is the best place to start. I don't think I would have, 
the way I actually got into the program was I won a gold at BJCP in 2016 and like Cicerone had like a booth there and Pat was like, hey, if you're winning gold at these competitions, you should become a Cicerone. And I was like, <laughs> what sure. the heck is a Cicerone? Um, but uh, yeah, and I think, I mean, brewing teaches you styles, teaches you the ingredients, teaches you flavor. Um, you really just have to focus, I feel like draft and pairing are a little outside of what you'll learn as a home brewer just from brewing. But um, it's like a great basis and a great start. Um, to get going. There's a, there's a lot of good online resources too. Uh, BJCP has a lot of free resources um, that you can use. Uh, you can also download the draft quality manual if you don't have a lot of experience um, or don't have the opportunity to be in a actual bar or mm -hmm. if you don't have a homebrew like draft setup because um, that's an important part of the test too is and it gets kind of in depth too depending on what level you're going to but that's yeah. a really good resource. Um, and then just like a lot of brewers publication books are really good resources as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, also feel free to hit both of us up. I was, yeah, I was gonna say, I have some blog posts and things. If, yeah, um, for any sort of like, um, you know, tips and tricks on on how to do it. But, but also just printing that outline, you don't even have to print it, just having that, their that, uh, syllabus and going through and as being as like going through each step and like knowing you could answer it on the fly at any moment is a good way of of study and like yeah. saying it out loud yeah. helped me. Like I'd have to be like, I have to say this out loud. Otherwise I'm going to cheat and just look it up. Right. Yeah, totally. That's totally true. Yeah. Okay. We have a couple more minutes and I'm going to, I think we have one more question here. How do you ladies feel about buying the Roxa kit for flavor testing? Are there off flavors that either of you can't taste? How did you train yourself to sense them? So I, this is like kind of, um, there's a lot of different viewpoints in the Cicerone, I guess, community about Aroxa versus um, Siebel. I I did all of my, um, all the way through advanced on Siebel, which is cheaper and totally worked for me. I did great on the tasting on both uh, Cicerone and advanced Cicerone tests. Um, people say that the Aroxa uh, compounds are a little cleaner or a little less, they're a little more pure. Um, I didn't pay for them. They're, I find them very expensive and I don't have a lot of people to split, like split it with. Um, so, but I did, uh, I'm taking master in October and I did take the Aroxa tasting certification class in, um, which is like a week long class and it's very expensive. <laughs> um, and that actually totally helped us. We basically were able to identify anything that we are blind to. Um, I wasn't blind to anything, which I feel very lucky. Um, just like genetically, I'm not, it's not something that I, I'm missing out on at least in that way so i guess anything that i can't smell on the test is on me it's not on my, my <laughs> genes um but i think i mean the way that people um figure out that they're blind to things genetically is just by smelling a, a spiked um something spiked and not being able to tell it's there um i definitely do suggest doing siebel at least if you can um and not trying to do like i know people will say like oh i smelled you know, melted butter, I smelled um, green apple, like to try to get what those compounds are like, but like diacetyl does smell like mel melted butter, but not exactly like melted butter. And especially when it's in, in beer, it's a little different. Um, and same thing with like acetaldehyde being like a green apple. It is like a green apple, but it's also a little bit more like grassy and like fresh in a beer. So I think, I think if you can um, at least get Siebel, that's helpful. That was a long answer, sorry. Yeah, I'm glad that you said that like not, all the things that are on those sheets as descriptors are what people get. Like, you know, totally. green apple, like you could say Jolly Rancher. I think it tastes, for me, it's like pumpkin. Like people get have way different, you know, things on there. Um, I've been able to do both. And I thought they were both like doing, this is an embarrassing story, but I'll tell you, uh, you know, I thought that I didn't have to do the off flavor. I could just read about it and it would be fine. Mm -hmm. um, for the, cause I've, I had to take, I've taken, this was the second time taking an advanced run. And I, the, I, we did the off flavor. I was like, oh, shoot. You know, like I yeah. reading about it is not enough. So like you do need to find a way to get those off flavors. You could kind of, there's some like tricks and tips to DIY some of them. So mm -hmm. if you don't want to, because it does get expensive. Um, but yeah, just try to try to do them because it's, it's very, it's, it's so important. And another thing, because it is expensive, um, I wouldn't do it too far out from your test. I kind of think of um, doing that like the week before and even if you can the night before your test. Like I I like did um, some Siebel spikes in my hotel room the night before my test. Um, but I, I think like doing it a couple months out, I mean, it's still beneficial, but you want to have those like 
right there at the front of your sensory memory. So if you're, if you say you can only afford to do like two sets of the feeble, um, I would do both of them in the week before my test. Probably I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it too far out unless I could do it with a bigger group where it was less expensive. And that's um, a good call. Yeah, that's your point. Like so ethyl has hexanoate to me is like totally, totally cranberry juice and everyone else mm. is like, Oh, it's black tea. So it's like, it, it is important to be able to do these things because you just have to know the scent and how it's going to appear to you if you want to be able to pass the tests. Yeah, you have to be able to personalize. But a lot of a lot of homebrew clubs will split off flavor kits, so you can always like, you know, this is a a good way why networks are so important, like um, to find people out there that are, are like because they only come in sets of like six, so you have to find someone that's going to help you. But I think Stacy also said I believe there's a there's pods that are coming out, which is cool for like individual oh. pods. Yeah. Well, we are at that's time. And I have a fun announcement to make. Uh, so we uh, I get we get to announce the winners of the Siebel sensory training kits. Uh, so three oh, lucky people. That was yeah. a perfect question. I know. I know the segue was too good. I had to jump on it. Um, and if you're not in this session, you're going to be emailed. But I guess you're not here, so you're not hearing me. So who cares? Uh, but it's uh, three uh, Siebel sensory training kits and plus a live guided training and Q and A with someone on staff, which is really cool. Um, so the three win winners are Christy Macbeth, uh, Kirsten, I think it's Kirsten or Kristen Thomas, Jennifer Russell. So it's Christy Macbeth, uh, Kirsten or Kristen Thompson, Jennifer Russell. And I'm then we also- so jealous of that prize. I know, me too. So cool. It's so cool. And we also have a Cicerone winner. So this is uh, a winner of a Cicerone Beer Savvy Training plus um, the Certified Beer Server Exam. So that's a good one as well. Um, Definitely. And the winner is Zenia Brink. Zenia Brink. Zenia. That's Zenia. awesome. It's, I'll just go throw that in the chat because uh, hopefully Zenia is here. Um, anyway, Zenia Brink. Uh, so, yeah, those are some winners. But um, thank you all so much. I, yeah, I hope everyone had fun with their shimei and their little something. It was two fun beers I haven't had in a while. So. And they're so different too. It's like yeah. a trajectory of styles. Like I'm like drinking Lagunitas as a newer beer drinker and then making your way to the like Belgian classics. Totally. But again, hit us up if you ever need anything. I'm Shauna Cormier um, and uh, don't hesitate. Yeah, this was so fun. Um, yeah, here's with Mandy, wherever, <laughs> on all social media. I just started a TikTok, so I'm really everywhere now. <laughs> oh, girl. And good luck with your master. Oh, thank you so much. October. All right. Thank you, everyone. See ya. Bye, guys.